Welcome back to the Level Up Podcast. Once again, what we're having, uh, well, this podcast was developed to facilitate challenging real and raw conversations with minorities about their unique experiences in the workforce. And today we have with us on the virtual couch, um, Elio Armand. I hope I said that right, the last name. I always, I always butcher those last names for some for certain reasons. Okay, Harmon. Harmon, gotcha. Um, and, you know, he's going to talk to us a little bit more about, you know, his background and tell us about what he's doing and how he's gotten started up with 614 Startups. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us, man. Listen, man, it's good to be on the virtual couch, man. It's good to connect with you guys. Yeah, for sure, man. Thanks for doing this. You know, I, before we kind of get started, just kind of give me a little bit of, of your backstory. What's your origin story? Where does all this started from? Talk to me about, like, coming uh, to America, life before and also your experiences in the corporate space working to 614 startups. Yeah, man, so uh, classic immigrant story in the making. Um, I was born uh, and raised until I was about nine years old in Liberia, West Africa. Uh, we left Liberia due to a civil war, uh, a very brutal civil war, 14 years plus. Um, and, you know, although you, you, you watch wars on TV where it's one country versus the other, what is crazy is that sometimes the most brutal civil wars, I mean, the most brutal wars are when people turn against one another, when neighbor yeah. turns against neighbor. And so uh, we had to deal with that. My father was a, a politician. He was a senator in the government. And, you know, I think a lot of people in the United States take for granted kind of the peaceful handover of power at times of election. Well, in cases of civil war, if you're part of the former government, you know, it's off with their heads, right? Because it, it is a, a complete revolution. Uh, and so we were fortunate, one of the fortunate, um, maybe not so few because there are a lot of Liberians in the diaspora, but we were one of the fortunate people who had the resources to actually leave on our own terms. Uh, we left the country back in 1990 or so. We went to Sierra Leone. And because the conflict in Liberia was so brutal, and the warlords in Liberia needed funding, the war actually spilled over to Sierra Leone. Now, Sierra Leone is legendary for their diamond mines. Blood uh, diamonds. That's right. So if you've ever seen the movie Blood Diamond, Diamonds it, and, and Lord of War, it all centers around the Liberian Civil War and the spillover into Sierra Leone. So uh, very, very brutal. We were refugees in, in Sierra Leone, but we were those fortunate refugees, so we didn't actually have to live in a refugee camp. We were actually able to rent a property, live there, and have a fairly stable lifestyle, uh, even though we were, um, war was always on the horizon. Uh, fortunately, in about 1992, 93, we immigrated to the U.S. Um, and uh, lived in New Jersey. Uh, so right from Africa, straight to the East Coast, first winter, I was like, what the hell? We can't uh, you're, December. You're frozen. Yeah, I'm from, so, so you're excited to see snow, but then you're like, oh my goodness. And, and you know, when you, when you come over, you know, we, we, and you, you, don't, you take for granted when you have a stable life, like now we live the middle-class life. Mm -hmm. But how much um, social service organizations do for people who don't have the resources? And so we were helped by like Lutheran social services to get clothes. We were helped by some other social services to get an apartment, things like that. So there are people out there who are the unsung heroes uh, when you're down and out and people who help you get on your feet. So we were very fortunate uh, at the time in New Jersey to have that kind of assistance. Started going to school, got roasted. Because, uh, you know, it, when you're different and you come to middle school, I was like, oh, my gosh. You know what I mean? Like, it, it was so brutal. But then uh, what you learn early on is that you have to stand up for yourself. Uh, people are not going to leave you alone until you finally stand up for yourself. So I uh, went through that whole hazing process. And so that's why I sound like this. So I'm, I'm Liberian until I was nine years old. But when you come in middle school, you got to get rid of that accent, man, because that puts a target on your back. And so uh, I was fortunate enough to kind of some of the people who were some of the, the, the most brutal initially became friends over time. Uh, and so I'm finally adjusted to life in the United States. I'm making friends. I fall in love with football. I start playing football. Um, fortunately, in New Jersey, you can play football in middle school. 
uh, but we go, go to high school. And my freshman year, I start playing ball. I'm doing well. And then my father comes over and says, we're moving to Ohio. And I'm like, you might as well have said we're moving back to Liberia, right? It was like, I'm, I'm a city kid, right? I'm, I'm East hey man, Coast, kid, man. I understand, man. I'm from Chicago, so I, I kind of understand, you know. Here we go. So um, came to Ohio, super depressed. What am I going to do here? But um, Ohio has become my home, man. It's, it's grown on me. Um, I think it's a great place to raise a family. Uh, I think it's a great place to do business, go to school. Um, you have access to everything anyway because everything is so close, either in driving distance or you can fly anywhere in the States. Uh, and I think it's a land opportunity, man. Um, really, everybody's not siloed. Uh, if you do a good job and, and you know how to network and you know how to build relationships, you can do very, very well in Ohio. So um, that's a little bit about me. Went to high school here, one at Ridge High School, Ridge Hype. You know, okay. what I mean, forty-eight, forty-one. Uh, then went down. They were pretty good. Year. They were pretty good this year. We were balling. They were pretty good this year. <laughs> Von Cameron is a beast. Von yeah, Cameron please. is a beast. Yeah. Um, yeah that's, so, that's a whole other podcast. But he was, he was, he was, he was really good. He's a baller. He's a really baller. Good um, forward. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a baller. So, um, uh, uh, played football, and then I went down to Springfield, Ohio, to Wittenberg uh, for college. What position? Uh, I played uh, corner. Okay. I'm yeah. A so. Oh, you play linebacker? Yeah, a little bit every now and again. You know, got okay. my shoulders a little dusty. You know, so Wittenberg. Yeah, Wittenberg University down in Springfield. But this was my 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 parents were extremely strict, and so college is kind of my first time getting out from under my parents' roof. So you know, I party my way out of that school, man. Too many keg stands. <laughs> You know what I mean? Too many, uh, you know, some other recreational activities that won't be mentioned right here. <laughs> um, and in my family, it was either education or you uh, had to get a job. And so because I didn't really have direction around studies, and Wittenberg is not an uh, uh, inexpensive place to make a lot of mistakes, right? Every year is going to cost you. I'm still paying for some of those uh, years that I wasted. But um, decided to come back to Columbus, Ohio, uh, and a family friend got me a job in finance. So my first real career building job was in finance. I worked for uh, a couple local banks here. Uh, and in 2008, the economic crisis hits, you know, banking is in turmoil. Uh, mm -hmm. I meet a guy, he's a mentor at the time, uh, and he introduces me to healthcare. He says, you know, if you ever want to look at an industry that's recession proof, in fact, that actually thrives during recessions, you have to look at healthcare. Uh, okay. Because during economic downturns, you know, a lot of things happen health-wise mm -hmm. that people are going to need help with. So I started working in the home health industry uh, for basically a mom and pop kind of organization, learning okay. on the small business side, which I enjoy. So I kind of had that banking corporate experience. And then now I transition into a small uh, business with about 50 employees and, and that was just giving me a different skill set you know understanding operations understanding management understanding sales uh, for a small organization and then um, about three years ago I got recruited to work for National Church Residences which is the largest provider of affordable senior housing in the country I work in their healthcare division in home health and hospice so uh, that's kind of the corporate career side. I started 614 Startups in 2017, and this was shortly after the Cover My Meds acquisition by McKesson. So okay. this is a billion dollars kind of splash all over the newspapers, all over the media. And I said, you know what, man, this, this town that I moved to back in 1997, 1998, this is not quite the same town. Uh, and it's not going to be a small town for, for much longer if we're having large exits like this in the startup world. Mm -hmm. And I really couldn't find a single source of information that would really provide me an insight into the startup world here in Columbus. So I started 614 Startups. Now, I could have started writing. I could have started uh, a, a myriad of different ways as a media company. But I started as a podcast because a buddy of mine had the equipment. So the whole reason why we started podcasting is just because a friend had the equipment in order to do so wait. so wait let's let, let me get this so you are financial services what what made you decide hey i want to be in media right now like where did that shift come because i know to kind of back up a little bit before that um in your corporate as you are navigating those corporate spaces you were still like in the mindset of 
an employee, being an associate and, you know, climbing that ladder and doing things of that nature. So it's kind of like you made two paradigm shifts, one that you uh, kind of wanted to take on this passion project or this entrepreneurial vis venture that that bloomed into what it is today. Mm -hmm. And also uh, from, the you know, understanding that you have all of these different ranges of experiences that you had the opportunity to take a place from um, coming to America, understanding that and having an appetite for, for uh, that appetite for success from a uh, immigrant's perspective. Um, also being able to learn and navigate how to deal with different spaces like you talked about a little bit when you were in, in grade school, understanding like what that looked like and being able to take all of that wealth of information from being that student athlete um, to <laughs> being a real student athlete, you know, and really taking advantage of that college experience to have that network of folks to see like, hey, I see my, my, my friend over here has this opportunity or has this equipment. I see this opportunity. When did, when did you start to make those connections? Uh, well, you know, all right. So even though I was a corporate employee, I, was, I, I'm, I have an entrepreneurial mind. Now, it, it's really popular to say that now in 2020 because everybody needs a side hustle. Yeah. Right? We, we understand how unstable things can be right now. Things are changing so rapidly. I mean, 2020, just what's happened in the first five months of 2020 is enough to fit the previous whole decade in terms mm -hmm. of complete shifts that have had to happen and will continue to happen over the year, maybe over the next five years. So you, the, the question was, you know, how did I decide to get into media having uh, experience in corporate and then working in small business? Well, I always um, dabbled in um, different forms of communication, which is what happens to come to me easiest. So one of the things that I find, and, and I think this is important for everybody who's listening or watching this, is that there are certain things that come to you easy that are very difficult for other people. Um, and if you follow the path of the things that come to you easy, and you do what's ethical and what's legal, you'll find that you will be swept to success, right? So what comes to me easy is having conversations with people, right? So like what we're doing right now, mm -hmm. even though there's cameras on us, even though I know this is being recorded, for some reason, it comes very easy for me and you to have a conversation and basically tell a story, make it yep. interesting as we go. Um, so, Going into media, which for me is really about storytelling, is just me doing what feels like it comes to me easy. So when there was an opportunity, at least as I understood it to be an opportunity, for some people, they couldn't even see it, maybe. Mm -hmm. it, what, it didn't trigger in them that Cover My Meds exit was the start of something very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So to me, that occurred immediately. And the only lens that I could see it through is covering it through a media company. I didn't automatically say, hey, I want to go out and start a startup. Hey, I want to go out and become an investor. Hey, I want to go out and become a software engineer. Hey, I want to come. You, you, all of those things that would trigger for any number of people because those skill sets are uh, pathways that are just open in their mind. The mm -hmm. pathway that's constantly open in my mind is this storytelling pathway. So that when that comes yeah, for you. It, it, it is just, it's the, the bigger lens that's wide open in my mind. And, that, and that's what I saw that particular exit through. So that's why it was just natural to go into media because it just gave me an opportunity to tell stories. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, for all of our viewers out here, because I'm, I'm pretty, you know, I, I'm hip on what six, 614 Startups is and like some of the work that you guys do. Uh, but for our viewers out there, uh, could you tell us what uh, 614 Startups is and also a little bit double click into like what compelled you to actually start it you know outside of you just being a really good conversational guy okay so 614 startups is a living organism right okay. it is growing it is adapting it is changing to its environment it is a platform that lets me exercise my creativity so that's the selfish reason. So um, like any business, in order, it, it's super hard to be, to achieve success in any avenue. 
at some point, you hope to find an avenue that feels like you're just playing around, right? So there's, there's nothing, I mean, I could give you the corporate speak as to what 614 Startups is, which I'll give you here in just one second. Okay. But the, the, it, it is a playground for my creativity, right? It's a platform that just, I think about it day and night. I think about all the hundred and thousand things I could do with it. And I have to put it on the shelf because, you know, I can't do all that right now. I don't have the flexibility. I don't have the freedom. I don't have the time to do all of that. So uh, from a personal reason, why I love doing 614 Startups, it's a platform for me to express my creativity. Now, how does this serve the audience, right? Which is kind of the elevator pitch. So the first thing that I look through is, well, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Mm. So the problem that we're trying to solve at 614 Startups is that most of the venture capital and most of the attention in the startup world goes to the coast. So everybody knows Silicon Valley, everybody knows New York, everybody knows Boston. Some people know, know about Chicago, where you're from which gets a fair amount of venture dollars, Austin, and there's some other places in the country. Again, just like the kid in, in, in New Jersey, I mean, we're here in Columbus, so we know what's happening, right? We think we're the stuff. But if you go outside of the state of Ohio, uh, and I just had a, a, a conversation with another prominent business person, he's like, if you go outside Ohio and you say anything about how, people are like, there's nothing over there. It's like you and I, and, and this, for all my folks from Nebraska, I'm not trying to shade you guys, I'm just trying to give you an example. <laughs> Like we're in Ohio, if you told me like something's going on in Omaha, I would look at you the same way because I just don't know what's happening in Omaha, right? It just seems so far away. And that's super interesting, you know, because in 2018, uh, Forbes uh, ranked Columbus as like the number one city for startups. So that was super interesting, but I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, that's fine. And, and, that's, and that's good. But what I'm saying is it would be the equivalent of me saying like, yo, it's popping in Omaha, Nebraska. You'd be like, Omaha, Nebraska, like, what are you talking about? I'm cool, Columbus is fine for me. It's the same thing. And, and you know, you can't overcome the weather on the West Coast, right? I, the weather on the West Coast alone in Southern California will give that place extra bonus yeah. points. And so uh, in New York City, the international feel and all the connections that you could make and, yeah. You know, it's just it's a different world. So they have their own. And in Florida, you can't even compete with Miami, the beaches and all of that stuff, right? So mm -hmm. um, that's the problem, right? Columbus, Ohio, or Ohio in general, uh, all the attention is on the coast. Second issue is that because all the attention is on the coast, all the money flows to the coast. And when all the money flows to the coast, startups here in Columbus, Ohio go unfunded economic development is slowed. So you would go downtown right now, and for us, Ohioans, the pace of progress is at an incredible speed. Mm -hmm. Like what's happening in Franklinton, you see what's happening up and down High Street, you see what's happening in Old Town East. You feel Our like there's, correct. But if you compare that, right, to the economic development, the startup funding, the companies that are being raised and skipped, we are way behind. Mm -hmm. All right. Even with the things that are happening in Cincinnati and Cleveland, Ohio is still lagging behind a great deal. So really what 614 Startups is attempting to solve is that all of these things are working against us. We want to tell compelling stories that are going to change the narrative, right? Where when somebody discovers a piece on 614 Startups, it takes them down the proverbial YouTube rabbit hole. You know how you'll start on YouTube and you'll start researching something and then you'll see all of these recommended stories on the side. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you, you don't think COVID-19 is a real thing or something like that. It, it'll take you down this rabbit hole. So what 614 Startups is, here's an introduction to a company called Script Drop. Oh, we pull you into our website. Now you are in our fund. Now mm -hmm. you're going to discover all these things about the state of Ohio that you didn't know before. And at least Ohio can become a, um, uh, uh, you know, a little bit more prominent on your radar. And this is for big investors. This is for startups who are looking to relocate. This is for people in the city who just don't know what's going on. So essentially that's what 614 Startups is. The problem is that all this attention is going outside of us. We need to pull that attention in and I think that's gonna pull the resources. And so we're building a storytelling platform to make the compelling case for why people should live here, start business here and invest here. So that's essentially who we are. 
that's really cool. I mean, and and now that we're kind of, you know, going through this COVID-19 uh, situation that everyone is really going through, the whole world has been on lockdown for the last two months. Um, How has that affected the way that 614 Startups is has operated. I know a lot of startups have been losing like funding and not necessarily getting the foot traffic or the revenue coming in. How's that kind of changed your appetite for covering these stories? Well, I think um, we didn't really have a plan uh, to manage COVID-19. No one really did, right? Did. Yeah, we really didn't have a plan. Um, and so like, like, many businesses, we were caught on our heels. We didn't really know how to react, right? So, but first things first was suspended all in-person recording. And right before COVID really hit, we'd done our first video podcast. So we've been audio all this time. Uh, and we'd done our first video and it came out great. It was with um, Jimmy Devine over at Root Insurance. It was a big deal. We felt the momentum and we had to shut it down. And for three or four weeks there, I didn't record. And it was just like, well, we got audio podcasts. Um, so let's just ride this thing out. We'll see when we might be able to go to market again and, and start recording. Mm. But, and then we lost one of our sponsors mm. um, for the podcast. Uh, however, um, we knew we would bounce back, right? It was just a matter of time. People make adjustments like this. So it was no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. um, what I started to do though was see on social media that some people were going on the defensive like we were and mm -hmm. just kind of pulling back. And then some people were going on the offensive, right? Mm -hmm. Because of technology that it afforded you an opportunity to not have to be in person with everything that you did. Like we love, like I enjoy being around people. So what we started to do was use more IG live sessions. So inspired by like D nice and, Verses and all that mm -hmm. stuff that's happening with live that's completely, you know, Swiss Beats and Timberland started a whole company yeah. off of live sessions, right? Of, of legendary musicians vibing back to back. You know, that's a whole media empire that they're probably going to build out of Versus when it's all said and done. And so just looking at things like that, I said, well, how can we strategically position ourselves if this is the new normal? So how do we continue to run this company if all we have is technology to facilitate what we do? Uh, and so we just stepped on the gas and started putting out more content. And one of the things that I resisted doing, which was writing, I started to write. So uh, Ch uh, Chelsea, who's, um, I think she's the COO of mm -hmm. Level D&I, um, reached out to me about getting on the podcast. And one of the things with, with getting on our podcast is that the demand is such that, and I'm only recording once a week, I'm trying to get away from what we had before where we would record this week and it wouldn't come out for six weeks. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is record in real time. Like, so if I record you this week, I promise I'll release it next week. And with that, we've compressed our uh, editing schedule. So it's been really tight. So I said, well, how can I offer guests who want to get on now, um, who I possibly couldn't get on until July, August, maybe, how do we get their content in front of our audience? And so it forced me to start writing. So I just did an article uh, decoding diversity and inclusion with uh, Chelsea and Kristen, your CEO. Yeah. Uh, and so there, there are so many different things that we're doing now that we're being forced to do as a result of COVID-19 that we we didn't do before or we didn't feel we needed to do because we were in our comfort zone that I think is now pushing uh, traffic to the website. It's growing uh, because we're borrowing from network effects. Like when, when we do something with you guys and then you guys post it to your page, it's giving us access to your network. So I think that's the biggest thing with COVID-19. Um, the other thing is that some of our alumni are actually thriving in this environment, right? Because they are so good at, at adapting. So a company like Script Drop, I think they're, they're set to do like eight times their projected revenue in 2020 um, mm -hmm. because of what's happening with COVID-19. So people like Nick Potts, uh, Ryan McManus over at Shear, uh, changing their transportation network to facilitate delivery for restaurants. Um, 
you know, uh, supporting small businesses and trying to engage with uh, small businesses like restaurants and coffee shops and understanding what's going on at that level. So this, this rethinking of what's essential, where our focus had always been on who's raising money, who's going to be the next tech company. Now it's, you know, how do we keep the corner coffee shop? How do we keep the corner restaurant? So we got some people who are non-traditional that would be on the show that are coming on to kind of share with the audience what's happening in their world. So more small business stuff. But those are some of the changes that we've uh, we the, the we've had to adapt to with COVID nineteen. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody. I mean, even not not just small businesses, but folks who are you know nine to fivers who are working in their roles. They've they've been forced to innovate in the way that they go about doing their jobs. Parents mm -hmm. have been forced to you know figure out new ways and invent ways to uh, meet the needs of, of their. <laughs> Exactly, you know, so that uh, my that lesson plan today was balloons. We learned about balloons, helium, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best teacher impersonation as well. Yeah, man. So that's that's definitely been that's definitely been super interesting uh, for me to like see uh, the wave of innovation and how um, COVID, you know, being as that, you know, as devastating as, as it has been to the world across these last couple of months. Um, I can definitely still see a lot of uh, the shining points coming out of this also and how it's kind of accelerated a lot of our hackneyed thinking and the way that we, uh, you know, I don't know how we plan on, you know, rolling out in innovations and uh, just updating companies and other things that has just been like so out of date um, mm -hmm. for so long. And now we're forced to kind of like jump into that situation. Um, I'm interested to see how this level of pace um, to innovation and how these companies have been making these things happen. I mean, kudos to uh, Columbus and other cities around the nation uh, who's made the changes from a city perspective, but companies like uh, Nationwide went 98% uh, work from home uh, since they've been here. And there's a lot of other companies that, that were able to do that didn't that didn't necessarily know they have the capability from a tech perspective uh, to get that accomplished. Um, how do you see a lot of startups um, really taking advantage of some of those opportunities? Because I think they have the flexibility and the agility to be able to do that. They may not always have the, cap uh, the capital though. Um, what are some of the opportunities out there for them um, from your perspective? Well, um, there are going to be some companies because they are high touch companies that are more impacted than the low touch companies. Okay. Um, I think the startups that are in the healthcare space, uh, particularly facilitating virtual care, mm -hmm. uh, or that are shrinking technology so that more applications can be done at home so uh anybody that brings healthcare into the home right now is going to do very very well so like script drop right they're bringing no longer do you have to go to the pharmacy we're bringing the pharmacy to you uh teledoc right no longer do you need to go to the doctor's office we're bringing the doctor to you uh, i do foresee a world and it, does, it might not be next year, it might not be two years from now, where there's a lot more uh, access to healthcare in your home that's more and more convenient, whether that's integrated into your smartphone, whether or not that's integrated into your smart devices, like your smart speakers, like Alexa uh, or Google Assistant or even Siri. So I think that that's the huge opportunity because I'm always thinking healthcare. Um, the, the, the travel industry, you know, if you, if you have a startup that's really focused on maybe booking airline tickets and you're getting a piece of that revenue, the Airbnb hosts of the world who have done really, really well, um, but we see that travel may be going to be something that's impacted for a long time, your hotel chains, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be grappling with this for a while. Um, your small mom and pop restaurants that maybe can't open at full capacity uh yeah just a lot of things like that i mean your dentists you yeah know, uh pe people going to the dentist's office and how that's going to be you know like 
you can't go if you have a fever, but what if the fever is as a result of your toothache? You know what I mean? Like, who knows, right? Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, until COVID testing is widely available, until we have a treatment, until we have a vaccine, we're going to be dealing with the new realities. But I, I mean, personally, I'm looking at anything healthcare right now that's attempting to bring healthcare into the home. You know, even vets, veterinary services in the home. How do we get vet technology so that people can get their pet care in their home? So all of those kind of startups are interesting for me. Those are things that I'm, I'm going to be watching just because of what I do uh, as well. Yeah, telehealth is uh, super interesting also. Um, just the, I, I know they've been talking about that for like the past year and a half, two years now. Um, so um, I work in the insurance industry, pretty much set up partnerships for Nationwide. Uh, so I kind of have to understand like what these different verticals are doing, um, especially ones that directly impact us, like healthcare. You know, um, generally where healthcare goes, insurance follows, and vice versa. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean anything uh, that's uh, IoT related, you know, Internet of Things, where it's actually you know meeting customers where they are on their phones and their devices in their homes, I think is going to be really large. Um, um, but to kind of piggyback and, and like backtrack a little bit, uh, when we took our little hiatus, our little break, yeah. um, kind of talk me through like what it takes to actually uh, produce a good podcast. I know with, you know, I think a lot of our, our visitors and our viewers actually want to uh, know that what it, what actually goes into it. Sometimes they think it's just literally sitting down and having the conversation. Some podcasts, that's the case. Some you got to do a little bit more research on the uh, on the guests and things of that nature, really understanding this technology thing. So, uh, could you speak to me or to us rather about your experiences and and what it actually takes to develop and produce a good podcast? Yeah, so you're gonna have to know your problem that you're trying to solve. So that's number one, right? So let's say, you know, I'm somebody. And I watch what's happening with Joe Rogan. I watch what's happening with Level D and I. I watch what's happening with 614 Startups. And I mean, how hard could it be? I mean, they're just like two people having a conversation, right? So I want to start a podcast. So I think the, the, the number one thing is that you have to be solving a real problem. Mm -hmm. So let's take Joe Rogan. Are you familiar with Joe Rogan? Yeah. All right. So he basically takes very, very complicated nuanced uh, subjects and he makes it palatable for high testosterone Neanderthals. <laughs> so you'll, you'll, and I'm not saying that as an insult, right? I'm not That's saying really that as an insult. Make, if you can make a child speak or a grandma speak for someone who, who don't necessarily have the insights uh, or the context behind some of the things that they're talking about. Yeah, I, I put myself in that category, right? So Joe Rogan would do a three-hour podcast about quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And a guy without a high school education will listen to the full three-hour conversation. That is the art of Joe Rogan. Most people don't understand that Joe Rogan has 8 million followers because he makes quantum mechanics palatable in a way that the U.S. educational system could not get a kid from kindergarten through uh, graduation to be interested. And yeah. he could get them to listen for a full three hours. Yeah. All have been in classics, classes where an instructor, qualified as they may be, couldn't hold our attention, right? And so there's so many things that as a society, we need kids to be interested in but there's such a disservice being done in terms of not understanding how people learn or the language through uh, how people learn best. And so we're trying to teach all kids the same way. So maybe Joe Rogan didn't set out to say, I'm going to build a podcast that's going to help, you know, mostly men, but a, a, a fair number of women mm -hmm. take an interest and have civil nuanced conversations about a wide range of very complicated issues. If I go to you and, 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 and if we did a wide poll of uh, men without a high school education and you ask them where did they get information about AI and machine learning, they're going to tell you Joe Rogan's podcast, right? 
they're not reading uh, 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 peer-reviewed journals by Ohio State uh, 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 scientists and researchers about AI. They're going to Joe Rogan while he has a conversation with Elon Musk smoking weed and talking about AI. That's how they learn about AI. If and, if they, and if they are reading, they're probably listening to like the ebook. <laughs> correct. The, the ebook version of it. But even the ebook, depending on who the writer is, could get pretty tough, right? Boring. It's like yeah. all trying to get through some of this content if you're, yeah. if you're going through the minutia. But yeah. so do you think that's easy? Getting, having nuanced conversation about complicated uh, 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 for people who don't have a high school degree? That's not <laughs> easy. That is the art of Joe Rogan. He makes it look easy. Yeah. Right, because he's also a comedian. He understands like comedic timing. He understands when to interject a joke. He knows when to pivot the conversation. He knows when to go after the host. He knows when to let the host go a little bit. He knows when he has somebody in an uncomfortable spot, he lets it off a little bit. But then he also knows when when to push that person. So Joe Rogan, if you don't think that is a problem that most of our society, the way that AI and machine learning is being thought uh, talk to them, turns them off. You don't understand what's going to happen in terms of people's reaction when some of these things start rolling out because they truly don't understand how it works. Joe Rogan is actually doing a heavy societal lift by helping people become comfortable with what is to come. Mm -hmm. Ignorance breeds a lot of negativity, right? And he's trying to break that stigma and do it in a way that he's just in the middle. You know, he, he always refers to himself and he's the smartest people in the world always refer to themselves as stupid. He's like, what do I know? I'm a knucklehead. I want to learn this stuff. And his audience can relate to him. So, And that's, that's like the gift of, of, of being able to have a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think for us, like, sure, we, we have this startup. We have this company, uh, Level DNI, but we have no idea. Or well, we can position it. We really don't know until you know, right, what's mm -hmm. really going on in the world. So let's have a guest. EDL come and talk about what his perspective is uh, from there. But but there is definitely um, some research that has to go into that. Like, you have to know your guests when they come on. I mean, it, it may be a tactic for you not to know. And that'll be an interesting conversation. But um, to my knowledge, that, those conversations really don't go that well. So it's definitely some research that you have to put into that. Um, and I guess, how do you stay up on like the, the industry trends? Well, so for a long time, I had to go out and and try to get guests. The, mm -hmm. the opposite is happening now where it's flowing in our direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and so because the, the pod, one, people need to know you have staying power. So let me, let me just kind of complete that thought. So one, you have to understand a problem that you're solving. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about technology. The barrier to entry in podcasting is super low. All you need is an iPhone and like an earpiece with a microphone and then the Anchor app. So anchor.fm, A-N-C-H-O-R.fm. Mm -hmm. You record a podcast on your phone directly into Anchor, and Anchor will then distribute it to, to platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, et cetera. So that's all you need from an equipment standpoint, you know, earphone, microphone, iPhone. That's it. So you know, now you know the problem you're trying to solve. You have that information. Now the next thing is consistency you have to decide on a regular cadence that you're going to release podcasts. So for us, it's weekly. But we're also, from that podcast, cutting out little mini clips, right, that add value in a minute or two minutes or less. So mm -hmm. we're putting out, so from that one piece of content, we're doing multiple types of content during the week for social media purposes, which is going to be a big part of getting people to listen to your podcast. But that's it, right? So that's basically our formula. Know your audience. Uh, the equipment is really easy to use and really easy, and it's free. Uh, and then the consistency. Once you get to the consistency, <laughs> you can grow your podcast. So I'm sorry. And what was your question? But I just wanted to kind of complete that, and then you you can go on to your next question. Uh, that was that was pretty much that was okay. pretty much the question. I was interested to you know kind of see how you stay up on on, on trends. Um, oh, trends. Yeah, much, yeah, yeah. So yeah. So yeah, we're we're starting to get information flow towards us, uh, which which is important. Um, we don't. I think, you know, the great thing about building a brand is that you don't necessarily, you, you want to follow, you, you want to be closely connected to your audience and understand mm -hmm. what's happening in their world more so than you want to, you want to be focused on what's happening 
in the world at large and bringing it to them, right? So one of the things that the mainstream media, in my personal opinion, does wrong is that they're, they're taking what's happening in the world and they're bringing it to you. In a world where that was your only source of information, that matters, mm-hmm. right? But if I was waiting for the mainstream media to bring me all my information, I would only get it through their lens. Mm-hmm. I can now go out and find my information on my own. So that particular model doesn't work. What I need to understand more than anything is what's happening in the minds of my customers, right? The people who are actually listening to the podcast, where are they? What are they dealing with right now? What are they afraid of? What are they concerned about? What are they celebrating? And then produce content around that because they immediately resonate. With it, right? How do you get that? Like, do you, is that like through messaging and, things of that nature, are you having like events and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. Uh, groups, Mm -hmm. things of that nature, is that how you get that information? Relationships. So just being open to having conversations. So um, I run into all types of people who have different perspectives on 614 startups and they give me advice. Uh, That could be, you know, just the average person uh, who doesn't have any business success to somebody who's ultra successful. I take all perspectives and take them into account. Like I said, it's a living organism. So it's, it's evolving over time. I think that's one of the things that people don't, I didn't do a good job of. I don't want to speak for everybody. It's really building relationships, just outside of the podcast, just keeping in touch with people, talking to people and helping people out. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing. And then, you know, what I learned from hip hop is, you know, because I'm a huge hip hop head, right? Mm Mm-hmm. There's nothing more important in hip hop than having the streets. Because if you got the streets, everything else will follow. Yep. So instead of trying to go and impress the record label, instead of trying to go and, and, and go after the decision makers, you go after the street, right? You, 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 do what the, you talk about what the, what's going on in the street and the record label will come. So it's the same formula. Right? Just it's watch- like you go and talk to the people and then everybody else will come. Man, I, I just watched, um... Man, Takashi six six nine. <laughs> he literally just got out of prison, and the first video that he dropped, literally the very next day, he has sixty four million views on this. He's gonna go number one. I mean, mm-hmm. because of, because of the relationship that he has with his audience, mm-hmm. and they were waiting. Sixty four million people were just waiting on him to get out and say hi. Yeah, and um. You know, but he's playing a very dangerous game. The most dangerous. Yeah. So you can't really compare yourself because he's willing to die for his art. Yeah. That's basically what the 64 million views say about him. Right. And I'm like, yeah, I don't mean it like it's a joke. So when when you see, so I don't use the term hip hop lightly when I say these people have the streets. Literally. Mm They are in the streets, right? Mm-hmm. So that is a very, very risky strategy. But and then people talk about authenticity all the time. This kid right here, somebody needs to sit him down mm-hmm. and say 64 million views or not. Are you ready to really die for your art? Because that's what he's playing with, right? You don't get those 64 million views because, like they say, the audience is 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 they love to cheer but they are dying to boo, right? So how many of those 64 yeah. million people are tuning in because they really support Takashi? And how many of those 64 million are tuning in because they want to watch the gladiator show that he is putting on for them, the bread and circus? How many people, those 64 million people are just cooped up in their house going crazy and to, they just want to see that young man continue down a road that we all know is not going to end well for him. Like it might feel good to have 60, 64 million views, Mm -hmm. but who are the elders around him telling him, young man, listen, it's not a game. Like what he did and why he went to prison. And now that he's out, even though he's getting all this fame and he's going to make a ton of money, Mm -hmm. we've seen it too many times. Yeah. Right. Some people are not going to take kindly to that. So, you know, that's the thing you got to be careful with. Yeah. You want to connect and connect with your audience. And when I say the streets, I mean a metaphor for, you have to be connected with your audience. Yeah, definitely. And I and I, and I purposefully uh, mentioned six uh, Takashi in there because I knew it was going to strike a nerve. Um, but I think and, that's, that's and definitely the a young conversation kids, that the we young need to kids, have. The young kids don't understand, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 38 years old now. 
and when you, you, you know, the, the Bible says when you become a man, you put away childish things. Clearly, you can see that that is a 25 year old. Yeah. Right. And I'm supremely disappointed in the people who are over the age of 30 who were some of the, the 64 million people that watched that. And then in the comments, you don't see like, you slow down, young man. Whatever grace has been given to you to be able to get out of the situation you were in, to be free, you got to use it differently now. Because all he's doing is adding fuel to the fire. So that's, that's what I would say for any young person listening to this is that, you know, there are certain rules that you have to abide by. And in the game that Takashi is in, he's not abiding by those rules. Uh, and even though he might have some short-term success, in the long term, he's going to end up hurting himself. So speaking about that, um, what, what's, what is one thing that you wish you've probably done differently uh, along your journey? All right. So there's the things that you think you could have done differently that you think would have made you that would that would have you closer to your goal than you are. But you don't know that that is true. So that that is the that is the trick of hindsight. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of people who live in the past end up with a lot of regret because they fall for this trick like. Well, if I had just done this, this, and this, and this differently, I would be different today. As a finale, you know, mm -hmm. um, I want to know, this is, this is a two-part question to end. Like, what advice do you have for aspiring entrepreneurs, and what can we do uh, from a Level Up perspective and Level DNI's perspective to kind of help uh, with 614 startups? All right, so advice. So I don't like giving advice uh on things that i'm that are not systematic like that that i don't know work right mm -hmm. i think i could give people like broad strokes stuff but i always like to stick to the things that i know for sure work so number one uh is you have to take very very good care of yourself um there's no amount of success that you're ever going to achieve if you end up making yourself sick mentally emotionally you know in relationships physically there's no amount of success that you're going to be able to attain that if you end up sick in any of those ways in my personal opinion it's going to be worth it so you have to take really good care of yourself at least the best care that you can because being an entrepreneur is very stressful number two always focus on building relationships whenever you can do a favor for somebody try to do a favor for them uh, whenever you can take the time to just listen to somebody, take the time and listen to people. Relationships are going to be critical. Everything that you want in this world, somebody else already has, <laughs> and they can give it to you. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you could, uh, you could. And I, I, I'm, I just got into season one of Billions, <laughs> uh, and there's a whole world out there that's outside of anything that anybody who's worth it, less than fifty million dollars is even closely remotely could capable of understanding and shows like billions even though it's fictional shines a little bit of the light into that there are people out there who could by saying one word absolutely change your life mm -hmm. right i mean all the hard work you could do for the next 30 years will not impact your professional success as much as a single call, phone call from a single person that opens the door for you so relationships are critical and then number three, do what you love. Life is very, very short. Like, I, I, every time I say I'm 38 years old, I cannot believe I'm saying I'm 38 years old. Believe it, brother. Man. Yeah, it, it came so quick. I know 40 is going to come quick. 50 is going to come quick. So if you're going to do anything, do something that you really genuinely enjoy. And then last but not least, man, love on your family. Take care of your family um spend as much time as you can with them do right by them you know provide for them and, and just love on them and that's the most important thing okay how can we help you well oh. six point four uh, startups so you're the second folks to ever have me on a podcast so that's our, always a big help i'm so used to asking questions it's good to be able to talk um so i appreciate that opportunity um i think the biggest thing 
is being involved with you guys uh, in the community outreach. I think in order for the companies that you engage with to truly have an impact when it comes to diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. is about outreach. It's about mm -hmm. trust. Um, and it can't be that the events that you have are in your headquarters, right? Like I said, you got to be in the streets. So it's got to be XYZ company sponsors a level DNI event, but it's at our bar. Mm -hmm. right? uh, or it, they sponsor a level DNI event and it's at King's Art Complex. It can't be so much this well, we want to bring the people to us. Mm -hmm. It has to be, let's get outside of these four walls and let's go out and talk to the people, right? How do we get companies engaged in the community in a real way, having conversations? That's something I'm certainly very interested in, in having a conversation with you guys about. How can we join our forces and do programming that's really impactful? So those are ways you can help us out, man. Thank you, man. Thank you for uh, coming and joining us today and giving us all that really good information about uh, what you're doing, how 614 Startups is impacting and changing the landscape of the community for startups uh, here in Columbus, future forward, the world, right? Um, yep. and, um, and yeah, man, thanks. I hope, I'm, I'm glad you're able to be, you know, sit on the couch with us and, and politic with us for, uh, you know, a couple of minutes, man. Um, to, to the viewers, I hope you enjoyed this show again. Uh, we were able to I hope this was able to add a lot of value to you guys today. You know, thanks for tuning in again once again. Until next time, leave a comment, smash that like button, subscribe to our channel, and uh, share as much as possible. Hashtag level up.